concentrate, concentrate. Everything depends on this one stroke. Hello, welcome back to the studio. Well, as you saw from my little doppelganger there, he was in a real pickle. The problem was he was starting to focus too much on the outcome and had forgotten the process. So what do I mean by that? Well, sometimes we can just focus so much on what we're trying to achieve, we must forget to have some fun with it. We forget that we're trying to actually do something enjoyable with our painting. Instead, we sit there looking staring, hoping Every brushstroke is going to be perfect, but it rarely ever is. And the problem is then we sort of end up analyzing, analyzing, analyzing what we're trying to achieve. Then we end up in another situation, paralysis of analysis. I can't even say the words right. But the problem is we end up looking endlessly at the ways to improve our art. And suddenly we realize that we're not actually improving. All we're doing is getting frustrated. And that's we throw down our brushes and walk away and declare it as a hopeless loss. I hope today's little video will try and help you out of that situation. Because I felt that just a simple painting is all I wanted to do. I just wanted to paint something in trees in it. Nothing more, nothing too complicated. An easy painting that would just get me over that little hump in the road. Where I could sit and play and appreciate process of painting as opposed to worrying too much about the outcome. So I picked a Bob Ross classic, Sign of a Forest, and I give it a little extra twist. But you'll have to watch right to the very end to find out what that is. Now in the background you can hear lots of sort of scratching noises. Bobby has found a box. And as she always says, if I fits, I sits. Even if the box is a little well too small. Anyway, on with the video. So here's my canvas, 16 by 20 portrait. I've painted it with a coat of black gesso and left it to dry. Now let's get on with the oils. For this, I'm going to be using Bob Ross liquid clear oil paint. I keep some in a small airtight container for ease of application. And of course I'll be using a nice old worn out Bob Ross landscape brush to apply it. This needs to be scrubbed on thinly. I can't emphasize that enough. Too much of this and your painting will become very slippy and slidey. I use an old brush because I want to really scrub this into the canvas. As you see, I do a little fingertip test. I don't want too much, but here's a better view of it from a previous video. Here you see I'm using the light from my mobile phone. If I run it across the canvas, there's no trace of my fingertips. Whereas this little piece is a bit too wet. You can see I've left a real fingerprint mark through that. That's what we want to try and avoid. I finish off my canvas with some long flat strokes just to even out the surface. I want to use that brush again, but I need to dry clean it first. So I don't add it quickly to the next layer of paint. Speaking of which, time we mixed up some oils. I've got some Prussian blue, some Van Dyke brown and some sap green on my palette. I'm going to start with the Prussian Blue and the Van Dyke Brown. Any clue as to what colour I'm going to get? You might be surprised but this produces a lovely green tone. I often use it for seascapes but today I think I want a little bit more sap green added to it. Give me a slightly more vibrant almost emerald green tone. Mix it well. I think we're just about ready. Now using that old brush apply a generous amount of this to your canvas. The problem is it's dark on dark and it's not always easy to see. Once again, I divide my canvas up into quarters and scrub it in well. But how can I tell if I've applied enough? 
Quite simply, I'm going to use my fingers. I touch my fingers to the paint and this is what I want to see. A rich, strong colour. Here's three little samples. This one's okay. This one, well, more oil. And this one, of course, no colour at all. This is what I'm looking for. I cover the whole canvas in the same thick layer of colour. And again, I do a little fingertip test. I want to make sure that there's nowhere left unpainted. For the next step, I want to use a fairly nice new soft brush. I'm going to go into some titanium white. Now, a little different to what Bob did, I'm actually going to warm this up a little bit. I'm going to add a touch of yellow ochre to my colour. Just a hint, mind. I want to think about where I want a bright spot, a focal point in my painting. I've decided to be one third down from the top and one third in from the side. As you see, I start off by making little circles, just swirling in colour. Now you can see that dark green colour we applied really comes to the fore. Work out from the centre. And if you need to reapply some colour, go back into that central area and start swirling again. You can increase the brightness of your painting step by step. Don't forget, if you've been doing this for a few minutes, you need to give your brush a really good dry clean before you try and put more white on it. Otherwise, you're not going to get that lovely bright, intense colour. Finally, I finish off with some soft, flat strokes. I just want to diffuse the colour a little bit, but not to lose all that lovely detail. Just like that, we've created a beautiful mottled background for our painting. Now, let's try something new. Bob didn't do this in his original version of Silent Forest, but I'm going to try and add some background detail by removing paint. That's right, if I scratch through the paint that we've just applied down to the black gesso, I can create background detail. This will really add some depth and distance in my painting. You can add as many or as few as you want. I also want to put in where I think some of the bigger trees are going to be. I used a small cut off edge of my palette knife to do this. Now, one advantage of doing this sort of painting is that it's very fixable. If I do something I don't like, I simply pick up my brush again and a quick swirl and it's gone. This has got to be one of the most fixable paintings I think I've ever done. I see an opportunity to do something else I rather like. It's to add some beams of light. I've picked up a fairly nice new fan brush, a small one, and just using it on edge, just drag it across the painting. Once again, if you don't like this, you could just pick up the one inch brush and swirl it out. I'm going to put two or three beams of light here, being careful to focus it from one central spot. That's most important, otherwise your beams look like they're coming from, well, all over the place. I also think I'm going to try and get some beams to go behind a tree and some in front of the tree. Again, you can play with this as much as you like. It is one of those paintings which, well, again, you don't have to worry too much about the outcome. Just enjoy the process of playing. I stood back and I'm going to brighten up one or two beams. They don't have to be particularly perfect either. Light tends to really break up through a forest and you get little sort of tails of light breaking through. I think this one might be behind and this one as well. Now, let's tidy up the tree trunk a bit. I simply re-scrape some areas of my tree. And to finish it off, I'm going to use a cotton bud. I simply run this up and down the tree trunk, removing any surplus paint I couldn't get off with the palette knife. Now, I got things out of sequence a little bit here. Yes, that's right. I did things in the wrong order. I started off by cleaning my fan brush, tidying up my palette, and then going into some black. I wanted to load my brush really well because I really want to darken some of the bigger trees. I want to give them some nice texture. And add one more. Right through here. This is definitely your bravery test. So I turn my brush on edge and just strike right through. I'll add some of this black colour 
to the tree on the left, and there's another big tree over on the right that's just on the edge of the canvas. Build this colour up nicely. We want a really lovely textured surface here. It'll make adding highlights so much easier. But as I said, I got things in the wrong order. But because I don't worry about the outcome too much, I don't really care. So what did I do wrong? That's right, I forgot to put in these bushes. They should have gone in before the tree. I even checked the instructions. I don't even think it mentioned them. So let's paint some bushes now. I've picked up a clean, dry fan brush. I'm going to go into some sap green, cad yellow, yellow ochre, maybe even a touch of Indian yellow. Load the fan brush quite well. Now watch carefully. I hold my brush flat to the canvas and just flick with the corner of the brush. Just let the bristles bump and strike the canvas. You can produce lovely drifts of colour. It's actually very easy, and Bob used to do this occasionally in a painting. It's a technique which I wish he'd done more often. There's a big tree here on the side. and You can't quite see it on the video, but trust me, there is one there. I'll just pretend it's not there and just work around it. I can always come back and fix the tree in a moment. I let my brush run out of colour, and if I pick up some of the black, I use it for part of the shadow. Here you see, I've done a little more. I go round my canvas, just flicking with the corner, thinking about where the light might strike the top of some of these bushes. I slowed the action right down for you, but trust me, it's just fun. Just scrubbing, flicking, and letting the paint land where it lands. I build up one layer after another, but don't forget, save some dark here and there. This is a great way of covering up these ends of the tree trunks where I scrape the paint away. Take regular steps away from your painting and see how it's developing. That looks a little bit on the bright side, but well, I can always come back and darken that slightly. There you are, I just knocked off some paint and just scrubbed it in. It's very, very fixable. I use my fan brush with some black paint to do any repairs. There, perfect. For the highlight side of my trees, I'm going to take some of this grubby white, a touch of red, and make a sort of pinkish colour. Now, I actually want to tone this down a little bit, so I'm going to add a touch of the Van Dyke Brown to it. Notice how I leave it very marbly, maybe a little darker as well. I'll cut off a small roll with my palette knife, just a tiny bit. This is for the highlights of my tree, the side closest to the brightest point of my painting. Yikes, that looks a bit too bright. Once again, it's very easy to fix. I'll just tap over it and the black that's already on the tree trunk will dull it slightly. I go up and down the tree trunk, adding little touches of detail. Try and stay nice and loose with this. Don't sit in one spot tapping too much. Travel up and down the tree trunk, adding little details as you go. I'll add a little touch of highlight to these trees on the right as well. But don't forget, the highlight changes sides. This time it's on the left side of the tree trunk. I know you wouldn't make that mistake, but well, sometimes it's easy to forget. I want this tree on the right to sit back a little more in my painting. I'll use a little bit more Van Dyke Brown in my highlight colour. Give it a nice tap. Once again, stand back often. Go back up and down the tree until you've got it just right. I think this one in the background also needs just a touch of highlight. Once again, it's a bit smaller, so I'm not going to overdo it. Now to make a blue shadow colour. Titanium white, some Prussian blue, and this time a touch of black to grey it slightly. This is for the opposite side of the tree trunk. This is what they call referred light. It's light that's sort of reflecting back from somewhere else in the painting, maybe from another tree. It really helps to make the tree stand away from the background. It really makes them pop. You'll notice that I add little bits of blue here and there and make sure it's not too bright.
just time to add a few little sparklers. Maybe one or two little bright spots on my trunks. There, I think they're finished. My trees need some branches, and for this I'm going to use some black, thinned with a little drop of linseed oil. I could have used liquid clear, but it makes it a little bit thick and gloopy. And I've come a cropper in the past using odorless thinners because it reacts with the liquid clear we first put on the canvas. So my choice is linseed oil. I'll do my best not to get my little finger in the way, but it seems almost magnetically drawn to the wrong spot, doesn't it? I want to think about doing some nice thin branches using the very tip of the liner brush. Remember the direction of these branches and the order. The tree in the background is further away, so this branch can cross in front of it. Now let's add a little touch of the foliage at the base of these trees just to settle them into the painting. We'll come back to that a bit later on. I might make some changes. Here you see, I just build up one layer after another, thinking about where the light comes from, where the highlights might fall, and where I want to maintain some shadows. I think I want to add some shadows at the base of some of my trees, so I just switch back to my fan brush with the black on it. I could have used some of the dark green colour too. I just stab it in. Well, as I said at the beginning of the video, there was a little extra in this painting. One of my little twists that you know I like to throw in. I wanted to include some wildlife in my painting, but I didn't want to have to go to the house of trying to freehand it because, well, that can be tricky sometimes. So I've done a little trick on you. That's right. I've actually got some wildlife already on my painting. I actually did a little sticking outline of a deer. I glued it onto the canvas, then painted right across it. I'll peel that off in a second, then finish my painting. So did any of you spot the little deer? It's right here. I'm going to use my palette knife just to sort of flick the edge up. I actually made this using masking tape. I'll make another little video soon that shows you how you can use masking tape and simply make a little stencil. It's really simple to do and it gives you a really good impression of where to position some wildlife in a painting without worrying too much about how it's going to come out or how you're going to do it. Once again, painting should be simple and not too much for chore. To make the little outline more visible, I'll use the light on my mobile phone. And here you see the unpainted gesso on my canvas. I was recently sent some brushes by Royal and Langnickel from the Meta range. They don't sponsor this video, and this is my own opinion of them. So I thought, a perfect time to give it a try out. Here, a little drop of linseed oil. A tiny, tiny drop is all you need. And to make sure I've not got too much, I'll just touch off the remainder on some kitchen towel. I want to apply a nice chestnut brown colour to the deer. This will help me spread the paint evenly over the surface. A bit like painting wet on wet, but in a very small area. Fortunately, I left this part of my painting for a few days, so it was already partly dried. It makes the deer a lot easier to paint. Now, here we have Van Dyke Brown and a touch of bright red. I'm going to use that same little brush, I dried it off slightly more, to make a nice sort of chestnut brown tone. I'll blend them together until I get what I think is the right sort of colour. And at this stage, I just want to block in the deer. To help steady my hand, I'm going to use my homemade marl stick. I don't want my deer to be too obvious. I want to be a little feature that you spot maybe the second or third time you look at the painting. A little colour to the back, the neck, and maybe the top of the head. Rest I'm going to leave in shadow. He does need a little bit of highlighting though, and for this I've gone for some white and a little touch of ochre on that same dirty brush. Once again, I think about the direction the light rays might hit the top of this little deer's body, maybe on the back above the rump, possibly the tops of the ears, top of the head. I'll just feather this in. I stand back and look 
my painting from the other side of the studio. But I think I want my tree to be closer to the deer. It's a simple fix. I'll use my fan brush and a little bit of that foliage colour and trim off the bottom few inches of the tree. If only moving a tree was that easy. But when you're painting with oils, everything is possible. Once again, no pressure to get this right. If I don't like it, the underpainting is already fairly dry, I can just dab this off and start again. I'm not worrying about the outcome, I just want to have some fun. I think that works quite well. Now, let's tap in a little bit of a dark shadow under the deer as well. That really helps to settle the little wildlife in my painting. A few more touches of highlight here and there. But I think I'm almost there with my painting. Just soften up a few edges. And here we are, the little deer almost completed. One thing I did notice though is that it's almost too subtle. When I stood back, I actually couldn't see it. I'll give it another little touch of highlight. I'm enjoying this painting so much, I almost don't want to stop fiddling with it, but I think one more composition change here. I want to add a little detail here on the near left hand side. This will bring that area of my painting further forwards and send the other parts by painting further back. Did you also notice I position things on hot spots? If you divide your painting into thirds, horizontally and vertically, you'll see the little deer is sitting on one little hot spot and the little bright light in the top left hand side is on another hot spot, one looking at the other. Again, just a little compositional thing, but fun to play with. So there we have it, my version of Silent Forest, a Bob Ross classic with a twist of course. So there we have it, a Bob Ross classic, Silent Forest, and I really hope you try this painting because I think something like this really help you overcome that sort of stumbling block where you're worried more about the outcome than enjoying the process of painting. I hope you will join me again at the studio soon. In the meantime, happy painting people. Oh, and don't forget, there's another lovely video coming right along for you next. I think a few more scratches, maybe a few cat treats here and there, and I think Puppycat's found a new bed. Well, at least for the next 10 minutes.